the Chaos Dwarves are coming. And they're bringing with it some of the craziest units in all of the armies of Warhammer. The likes we have not seen since the days of the Timercon book, but prior to that, the last time the Chaos Dwarfs had an official roster was way back in 4th edition. In this video today, we're going to take a look at the old 4th edition army book and Tamarcon to go over the units that we should hope to see in the Chaos Dwarf DLC coming out on April 13th. Keep in mind, most of this will be speculation based off of what these books say. And if this is your first time watching one of my roster speculations, I like to read the lore exactly from the book before going into some ideas on how they can be brought into the game. This time around, though, we do have a bit of a guide in the sense that we have most of the unit cards revealed to us by Creative Assembly. So we'll start out by going over those first, then break down the entire army, starting with special characters, going into lords and heroes, then talking about each set of units as broken up by their parent unit group. What I mean by that is we'll be talking about the hobgoblins, for example, all in one section since they are aren't separate army book entries for each unit like in more up-to-date books. You can quickly navigate to any part of the video that interests you the most using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. Also, if you have not yet pre-ordered the Chaos Dwarf DLC, make sure you use my affiliate link in the description to take advantage of this sale. You'll get a Steam key directly from Creative Assembly, and it goes a long way to support myself as well as my mini Aussies rabid treat addiction. Lastly, make sure you follow me on Twitch as we will be streaming the DLC as well as my many legendary campaigns. I'll be starting for Warhammer 3. You can also find that link in the description and can comment, but let's get started on the Chaos Dwarf roster lore and speculation for Total War Warhammer 3. And to open us up, we're just going to look at the unit cards that were revealed and just kind of quickly show off what units are what. And we'll just go from left to right here, or maybe I'll just kind of group them together. I'll do it by the fly, on the fly. So this first one here is our, what the hell is that? This first one here is um, the Chaos Dwarf Warrior, Warrior, right? Like we've already seen this dude and he has another variant right over here is the Chaos Dwarf Warrior with Great Weapon. So we see these two in the quote unquote flesh. Now we also, what the hell is that again? Man, this, this, this new thing I downloaded is funky. But we also get the Hobgoblins. So the Hobgoblins have a bunch of different variations. We get this one, these two right here. And then we get this guy right here. So this guy is just a standard edition. You know, he's got a, a sword and he's got a shield. This is your archer and this is your sneaky git. And he is going to have a precursor missile that did not, they did not have that in the Chaos Dwarf Army book. And we'll talk about that when we hit the entry, but we get three of our Hobgoblin units. We also have our two laborer units, which are right here, the Goblin Laborer and the Orc Laborer. I don't see any uh, black orcs. That is something that they did have um, in their older army book. So it looks like they won't be getting those. So we see those guys right there in the flesh. Outside of that, I keep saying flesh. I mean, it's a unit card, man. What's wrong with me? We also have the Infernal Guard. Now, the Infernal Guard, we know from the blog entry to have three separate flavors. We have the one here with the Great Weapon. We have the one here with the... Uh, fire glaive, and then the other one with the axe and shield. But we also have a different delineation of Infernal Guard called the Iron Sworn, which are basically better Infernal Guard only slightly. So that's those guys right there, more than likely. Um, I don't think that's a Regiment of Renown, and the second picture we, we show off, we'll talk about that. Now we have another Chaos Dwarf variant, and it is the Blunderbuss variant. And that is just weird. It's right there. There's our uh, little semi short range it's not a super one it's not a 145 uh range unit right we know it's we know it to be a little bit shorter um and by shorter it's 90 range so when i say a little bit you know i mean 55 <laughs> range shorter but a good missile damage on them nonetheless now for our bigger baddies we have the bale taurus i'm sorry just that's the great taurus and the bale taurus those are our two taurus tari if you're a Taurus yourself, you're very emotional. So there you go. Um, then we have our Kadai in both the Fireborn and the Destroyers right there. Then we have all of the engines, the Doomquake Mortar, the Cannon, uh, the Dread thingy here and there. We'll go over all these here, but these are the individual portions of the Chaos Dwarf train. So we have all those units kind of put together. Now, when we transition to this other picture, we get the cav elements of the army and we get the renderer, which comes in three separate spices, it looks like. Uh, we get the one with a axe and shield, a great weapon, and then the two-handed weapon variant. Um, and the reason I 
know that that's two-handed weapon variant is be, or two one-handed weapon variant just because I think this one's the regiment of renown version. <laughs> then we also get the goblin wolf riders, which are right here with the bow and arrow, and your uh, wolf raider actually is I believe what they're called, wolf raider. Um, so we've got a hobgoblin wolf raider, I, I believe. So we get those guys right there as well, and then our Lamasu right over here. Look, uh, look at the, I have a degree in graphic design, and you wouldn't guess it by the terrible boxes I can draw. Holy hot covered shit! Now, outside of that, let's change this to red. We have what I believe to be the regiments of renown. We have these guys right here which again amazing stellar box which are probably the immortals um and the reason i think this is not a unit because it doesn't necessarily look like a different coloration it does look like a different version this is either going to be a dwarf warrior or an infernal guard or an infernal guard iron sworn one of the three um the fact that his axes are on fire tells me that's probably on the lines of infernal iron sworn um i would assume that to be a different unit um maybe that other guy was a regiment renowned but i think that the iron sworn we can expect to see as a unit and the reason i'm saying this is because every single dlc campaign pack for the exception of the vampire coast has had six regiments of renown Wood Elves, Bretonians, and Tomb Kings all get six regiments of renown. They have gotten DLCs that have added to that, but six is in their base um, package. So if I take a look at this, we get a um, Infernal Guard or Infernal Iron Swarm, Regiment of Renown. We get a Chaos Dwarf Warrior, Regiment of Renown. We get a Hobgoblin Wolf Raider, Regiment of Renown that looks to just simply be a hybrid between these two, right? Because this guy has a spear and a shield, and this guy's got a bow. He's got a spear, shield, and a bow. So we're gonna see how that kind of plays out. Th these guys don't look anything unique, so I'm curious to see what they're gonna be like. Um, the re renders here, um, again, doesn't seem like they have anything crazy from the from the picture here that like usually like okay all this tells me flaming weapons this tells me this that and the other so I, I'm curious to see how these guys are going to play out and then we have a unit that doesn't look like it's a blunderbuss it looks more like it is a rifle um, and that looks like an infernal guardsman because here's our our normal dude the infernal guardsman has this helmet so this looks like a regiment of renowned infernal guardsman uh, that I mean oh the fire glaze right there so. Maybe this is just a straight up rifle, who knows? Maybe it's a blunderbuss, but it's definitely an infernal guard of some sort. So perhaps then this is the uh, Iron Sworn, uh, Infernal Guard, Iron Sworn. This is Infernal Guard, this is a renderer, this is a Dwarf Warrior, and this is a Goblin Raider. So these are the unit cards. Let's go into the roster now, and I'll bring them up in their respective section. But I wanted to go over this first so we kind of have an initial basis of units to expect. Of course, this is not the entire unit card list, right? We're missing our lords, our heroes, our legendary characters, and perhaps some other units, I have no idea. Um, well, yeah, another good example here is we know that the Hell Cannon is coming to the roster because it was in the campaign preview. So um, that is not here in display. So hopefully there's some other units that we have not seen just yet, but let's now jump into the roster. And our first roster entry to talk about is the special character, Astragoth. And that's what we'll talk about first are our special characters before jumping into the generic versions after that. But he is the High Priest of Hashut, and Astragoth is the oldest living Chaos Dwarf sorcerer. When he was at the height of his powers, he was the most potent sorcerer to walk the plane of Tsar in a thousand years. Now his powers have begun to wane. His body is slowly succumbing to petrification. A decade ago, he constructed a mechanical device by which he is transported from place to place. His legs have long ceased to work, and even his hands have have now turned to stone. To an extent, these have been replaced by the machinery grafted to his body. This engine was constructed by his slaves to plans created by Astragoth himself, and combines the undoubted skills of the Chaos Dwarf race with twisted dark science. So we've seen this character quite a bit, right? He's probably the one that we have seen by and large more than any character so far. And he is way faster than I would have ever thought he would be in his little cool mecha suit right with 60 staggering speed his stat line is 130 armor 60 melee attack 50 melee defense 520 weapon strength and 60 charge bonus but what are some of his abilities from the old rules as it were and he has a um a custom kit this time around right he pulls from the lore of fire as well as the lore of hashit 
And in the old codex, in the old fourth edition, it just simply said that he can he can choose up to four Chaos Dwarf magic spells. Back then, you had a Warhammer Battle Magic supplement, and it was a different way of getting magic than you got from the latter editions, fifth all the way on through eighth into um, uh, that terrible thing that no one wants to talk about, uh, uh, the end times. And in the fourth edition, you just simply, it was generic magic. You pulled cards and that was your magic and so on and so forth. So he didn't have a custom kit per se back then. He had a special kind of death blow capability. But by and large, what we're going to be getting with Astragoth, Astragoth is going to be very custom built, which I think is very exciting, right? We don't really know how a lot of his abilities are going to play themselves out. We don't know how contempt works across the entire dwarf military. And we don't know what this little like weird fisty hammer is in his uh, uh, unit card. But by and large, we should expect Astrogoth to have a lot of fun, cool abilities when it comes to his actual specific, um, his unique line, right? And he is a high priest of Hashet. So he has that characteristic, but of course he plays very differently being a character that is a melee expert. So not a ton to go off on Astrogoth because he did not get that full bit of rework like our next character did, but nonetheless wanted to bring him up before we move on. And our next character to talk about is Dras Oath the Ashen, a sorcerer prophet of Hashit, lord of the Black Fortress, master of the Legion of Asgore. For more than a thousand years, the dark burning spire of the Black Fortress has stood sentinel over the crossing place of the river Ruin at the southern edge of the Mountains of Morn, and guarded the border of the Chaos Dwarf Empire of Ash and Suffering. It is a nightmarish place of soot, blackened iron, and jagged rock, and burning magma runs through it like light blood. For centuries, the master of this dark domain and the warriors and slaves that inhabit it has been Drazo with the Ashen, a twisted, power-hungry creature and potent sorcerer. Drazoeth was first sent to the Black Fortress in effective exile after losing favor in the brutal politics of Tsar Nagrand as a minor hellsmith, but has since risen to become its lord through his innate cunning and bitter ruthless ambition. In battle, Drazoeth is both a mighty sorcerer and an able warrior who leads his war hosts from the fore, mounted upon the great Taurus Cinderbreath, bringing fire and ruin down upon the enemy. Drazoeth's power has grown over the decades, and there are few sorcerers now in the service of Hashet who can match him in arcane might or knowledge in the creation of war machines and demon binding. He also has undisputed mastery of the Legion of Asgore, a potent army of chaos dwarfs and hobgoblin slave soldiers based at the Black Fortress whose duty it is to raid across the river and patrol the savage wastes of the southern Darklands, to maintain the Chaos Dwarf's tentative domain over the deadly, monster-plagued expanse. But for all his power and the forces at his command, Drazoeth is all too keenly aware that he has reached an impasse, and his black-hearted ambition can take him no further. For the Black Fortress is many leagues away from the center of the Chaos Dwarf Empire at Tsar Nagrand, and it is ill-regarded. The voice of this Lord of Exiles carries little weight with the great conclave of Hashet's priesthood, and in particular none with Astragoth Ironhand, the oldest and most powerful living sorcerer of Tsar Nagrand, and the master who sent Drazoeth into internal exile long ago. Astragoth is ancient beyond measure, though, and at last his powers have begun to wane. He is kept mobile only by sorceress mechanisms of his own dark designs. And so Drazoeth's dreams of a triumphant return to Tsar Nagrand are slowly kindled in his spiteful breast. Drazoeth needs, above all, a great victory to seal his prominence, for when Astragoth finally falls and a great flow of fresh captives and plunder into the coffers of the Chaos Dwarf's empire would go far to expand his influence beyond his own blighted domain. This, however, is not proving to be such an easy ambition for Drazoeth to achieve, thanks to the enemies which constantly beset the Black Fortress, which are, after all, its reason for existing, and he has been left wanting. When dark rumors began to reach the lord of the Black Fortress of a monstrous horde rising in the east and crushing all before it, Drazoeth consulted the flames and embers of Hashut's sacrificial altars for what they portended. He saw in them both dire peril and opportunity in the coming of Tamarkan, and so with the malefic intent that so characterizes his cold-hearted race, he drew his plans accordingly. 
So with this character, we get um, a, very, a very ambitious character that is also banished, right? All the way over to the Dark Fortress, which we know is his, or I'm sorry, Black Fortress, which we know is to be his starting location, as revealed to us by the um, <clears throat> the blog on this. It's interesting that the lore describes him riding a great Taurus, but he rides Cinderbreath, which is a Bale Taurus, and even says that in his rules. So you've got that going here. But he is also a sorcerer prophet of Hashut, which is the lord level caster for the uh, Chaos Dwarfs. And he has the lore of Hashut as well in his rules. So I expect that to extend over into Total War Warhammer as well. His special rules are Resolute, Relentless, Contempt, and Demonsmith, which we don't really know how Contempt and Demonsmith really factor into this game just yet. Contempt, I expect, has to kind of... I feel like Contempt, and we'll get to it when we talk about the roster, but I feel like Contempt will be some sort of expendable forced upon the army so everything's pretty much expendable as far as the unit's concerned in a certain radius because that's kind of how it works for its actual rule but he gets dark renown here which is all chaos dwarf units get one to their combat resolution so i imagine he's going to give something where he'll increase leadership around him maybe even uh, melee defense um, as part of his presence on the battlefield in his, in his aura right in like a 30 35 meter radius but he's got three magic items too to take advantage of <clears throat> Hellshard Amulet is a talisman, the dark product of Drazilla's own labors and diabolic craftsmanship. The icy hate of his malice is caught and amplified a thousandfold within its black crystal depths and unleashed on any who would dare spill his blood. And this just simply gives him a ward, slave, <laughs> ward save and it gives him uh, a reactive combat capability. So if something hits him, he hits back immediately. And that's kind of how I see it translating into Total War Warhammer. Give him a reactive damage attribute perhaps maybe some fire resistance and a ward save as a result of the hell shard amulet then he's got the demon spike crucible as an arcane item forged from meteoric iron and blighted gold quenched in innocent blood and bound with layer upon layer of hellbound souls the demon spike crucible is said to have been the handiwork of the ancient chaos dwarf sorcerer asgore himself and um this basically helps him with casting and also it kind of has a reactive attribute where Anytime they kill someone in combat, him or his mount, uh, it increases, is consumed by the crucible and then bonuses to plus two, what? Oh, 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 okay. So I read that totally wrong the first time around. So what this does is it gives him a bonus to his casting. And then if he kills anyone, he gets a further bonus, which I think would be kind of cool for him. So maybe he gets some sort of addition to his... Uh, power reserves or winds of magic generation but if he's in combat it increases even further which i think would be very cool for a hybrid melee lord a hybrid melee caster to actually have a mechanic that the longer he's in combat or when he's in combat he actually gets more winds of magic or gets a better reserve or lowers his miscast chance whatever it is i think that could be very very cool but this does have a reactive um component to it because it's all that that bonus happens when he attacks or kills enemy wizards so maybe it's something of the sort where uh you can actually increase something's recharge either by being in close combat or that's just the way the ability works you press it and okay now they've got 50 more second recharge whatever it is we, we've seen that done with plenty of other characters before um malekith and uh luther harkin for example here but perhaps that's how it's, how it'll be done the Graven Scepter is his magic weapon. It is a badge of rank carried by the Lords of the Black Fortress. This Iron Staff Mace carries the runic name of the Masters of the Black Fortress since its founding, bound up with the Baleful Prayers of Hashut. And this is a really kind of simple attack weapon. Uh, it just simply makes it so it's easier for him to wound things. So I would assume that that would mean, that would kind of translate to um, an additional weapon strength or perhaps an additional AP characteristic because I've always looked at as far as the Total War Warhammer is concerned, melee attack has increased two hit chance and weapon strength is that ability to just kind of wound into something. Or maybe it reduces something's melee defense because the way the game looks at things is your attack has to actually hit, then the attack is measured against their melee defense to see if it's blocked. If it's not, then it goes against their armor to see how much damage is mitigated before actually hitting their HP pool. So maybe it actually reduces melee defense in a radius around him, which could work really well with that Dark Renown ability if it is increasing uh, your unit's capability. So that could be a fun thing that's done. Or maybe it's just simply an activatable that increases um, 
weapon strength and AP damage by like 25% or 50%, like a lot of other characters got, but very, very simple. And then again, lastly, he is on Cinder Breath, his Bale Taurus. Um, so fun, fun in the sun with Drazoeth. He's our only pure caster in the sense that he has one specific lore. Like I said, the lore of Hashit. Um, outside of that, he would just simply be um, a source or prophet with a, a slightly better attack profile. He has six weapon skills. So I expect him to kind of be along the lines of Astrogoth, but like, man, Astrogoth has 60 melee attack, which is really kind of horny coming out the gate here. So it'll be interesting to see what what his attack will be like, what his damage, what his actual, um, yeah, I guess his attack profile will be like by comparison to Astrogoth. If it'll, if it'll be on par, if slightly worse or slightly better, however it kind of plays itself out. And Lore of Hashid, however that works itself out too, is going to be interesting when, it, when it's kind of taken into consideration for this whole entire thing. Let's move over to our last character now with Satan the Black. And he's an OG. This guy is one of the very first characters we ever had here, right? So, Satan the Black, Commander of the Tower of Zar. Your army may be led by Chaos Dwarf General Zatan the Black, Commander of the Tower of Zar. Under the Dark Tower of Zar Nagrun, a million evil souls labor to the glory of Hashut, Father of Darkness. From a thousand burning forges comes weapons of burnished iron and corslets of ruddy bronze. It is the greatest city in the world and is ruled by the most black-hearted lords of all, the Chaos Dwarf Sorcerers. Acts of the most cruel and heartless nature are everyday occurrences in the lands of Zarduk. Thousands of slaves endure unimaginable agonies in the pits of Zar, mining out the poisonous wealth amidst choking fumes and impenetrable darkness. In the workshops of Zar Nagran, untold slaves are worked to death in their chains so that their masters can enjoy a lifetime of ease. The hobgoblin overseers in the Vale of Woe beat their pitiful charges so that their flesh hangs from their backs like bloodied rags. Even amongst such a wanton cruelty, there is one whose deeds of brutality are remarkable, Zatan the Black, commander of the Tower of Zar. Zatan serves the Chaos Dwarf Sorcerer Gorth the Cruel, most potent of all living Chaos Dwarf Sorcerers. It is said that when Gorth presides over the sacrifices of Hashib, the only sound louder than the screams of his victims is the gloating laughter of Zatan, his general. The Tan is kept busy by his master's insatiable demand for fresh slaves. The Chaos Dwarf has led many successful slaving expeditions to the west, crushing every orc army that has dared to stand up to him. All the goblin tribes between the plains of Zarduk and Mount Grimfang have bowed before his armies, sending thousands of his kind in tribute to the lords of Zarnagrand. The workshops and mines of Gorth can scarce keep pace with Zatan's demand for weaponry. Every ex expedition he undertakes brings further slaves whose labors fuel fresh conquerors. Or conquests. Conquests. I am clearly a raider. Uh, but <clears throat> Zatan here would be our pure lord, our overseer legendary lord because our overseer is the generic lord choice we have got for the Chaos Dwarfs. And he's not crazy here i mean he doesn't have any particularly unique magic items because that's just kind of old fourth edition rules you just you chose from a pool um like oh you carry up to three magic items however such as the stature amongst this kind is such as the power of master gorth that he may carry up to four magic items so it was different at that time they didn't have a bunch of unique ones unless they were very very specific um but for special rules the talon's cruelty knows no bounds he is the most pitiless warrior to tread the blackened earth of czar to represent this the Tan hates all enemies and is affected by the rules for hatred as described in the psychology section of the warhammer rulebook so i don't know if he would get something like that um and i also wonder if he's going to have any mounts even um, I would wonder if they would even show the mount off in the in the actual DLC. Although, to be fair, they didn't really show off um, Jazoeth. So perhaps he will have a great Taurus, and that'll kind of be the delineation between the two. Uh, or I, I don't expect him to be on a Lamasu, because I think a Lamasu is going to be reserved for the Sorcerer Prophets, since the, they've kind of struck in the line that the Lamasu is more magical creature, more magic people need to use it, and so on and so forth. I think that they'll just kind of give him maybe a great Taurus. The Overseers in general maybe have great Taurus, or great Tari. Um, but it'll be interesting to see if, if, if the... Oh! 
<laughs> I'm so dumb. May ride. Zatan may ride a Lamasu or a Great Taurus. So there again, I'm, do, I'm, I'm again stupid. But I do think that they were going to probably make a delineation between the two with a Lamasu probably being reserved for Sorcerer Prophets and Great Taurus being reserved for Overseers. And I think that's probably how we'll see Zatan here is on a Great Taurus. Um, he's a very iconic character though. And they, they kind of struck that... Uh, that same chord of having him look almost exactly like he ha did in the olden days. So it is cool to see him represented in that light. But again, I just think he'll be a, a pretty generic character. I expect him to have a lot of ben benefits to probably just generic Chaos Dwarfs and really kind of bo uh, boosting them. Or maybe he is your character that is <clears throat> focused more on Hobgoblins and Orcs, making them better. Hobgoblins, Goblins, and Orcs, right? Making your... Um, non chaos dwarf character uh, uh, units better in combat, and that might be his kind of role since he's so renowned in going and getting these slaves and whatnot for the chaos dwarf empire. That that might kind of be the shtick, and he'll go probably pretty well with Gordo's backstabber, our next character to talk about. So Gordo's is going to be our hobgoblin chieftain, and this is a, a single paragraph. All flame is fleeing and all glory ultimately fades away. The renown of hobgoblin chieftains tends to fade more quickly than most, usually with the help of a dagger, poison, or nasty accident. Gorda's backstabber has outlived most of the other tribal leaders thanks to a naturally distrustful disposition and lashing of low cunning. He also has been lucky as the hardened scar tissue that crisscrosses his massive bony shoulder hump testifies. So that is the quick lore on this character and we know exactly what he's going to be like as far as uh his campaign presence is concerned right the blog already kind of give gave us a little bit of a, a peek into his powerful buffs and stat bonuses so he gets uh he can keep ammunition flowing with shoot him or enable vanguard deployment for all hobgoblins with sneaky and if stealth isn't your style get the gits summons a band of hobgoblin cutthroats to command so uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, other kind of bonuses that he possibly gives to the army um <clears throat> he might write a giant wolf wolf and I, we saw that uh in the dlc trailer we have already seen what gordos looks like so we've seen that he's going to be on the back of a giant wolf as a possibility probably like you know level six or some crap like that um he has magic weapons but again i don't know if they're going to give him a bunch of magic weapons if any uh, probably like maybe one or two just to kind of solidify his rank as a legendary hero as part of a dlc pack and not an flc character or anything like that i would expect gordas to kind of have a little bit more going underneath the hood like i expect him to have quite a few skills i expect him to have one or two um magic items that give him some fun abilities because since he's kind of part of this paid pack I, I would want him to be a little bit more robust so i'm fine with him being a legendary hero but i do think he's going to need a little bit going for him so with not a lot to go off of i would love to see how creative assembly is going to kind of build this character out to be a little more interesting than just simply hey he's a legendary hero that gives a lot of buffs to your hobgoblins have fun but I still think, nonetheless, he's going to be a really cool addition to a lot of the characters. I think both uh, uh, Astragoth and um, Drazoeth are probably not going to be as great with the Hobgoblins, and this is where this guy comes in to kind of boost them up. Whereas Zatan will probably be particularly good with the Hobgoblins, and Gordas will even make them better, or maybe even help out with other portions of the army, whatever it is. But it'll be exciting to see how that kind of uh, heroic character, or uh, <laughs> heroic hero, plays himself into the mix. Um, he has some ballistic skill in the old book, so I wonder if he'll have any kind of precursor or shot a precursor missile or any kind of range capability in everything we've seen from the pictures and everything like that i don't think he's going to have any range capability but i, I mean i could be totally wrong I, I i just see him with an axe and a shield um and he wears light armor carries a shield and an axe i mean actually yeah his weapons armor don't even reflect that he would have of any weapons to take advantage of that plastic skill with so i expect him just to kind of have I, t I think it kind of is probably going to be more along the li lines of a uh, a goblin hero, right, from uh, from Greenskins. Probably a very similar stat profile, very similar presence. Not going to be a huge, huge, very strong combatant, but it'll probably be just enough to kind of tip something over the edge. But now that we've talked about all the special characters, let's start going into some generic things. And the first thing I want to go into are the demon smiths and sorcerers. Uh, the Sorcerer Prophet would be our Lord choice, and the Demon Smith would be our hero choice of caster for the uh, Chaos Dwarf army. 
And I think that they're going to kind of break up the rules here because they actually have a lot of rules, a ton of rules. And I think that um, uh, this would go a long way to kind of make the army feel very diverse and very different. So let's, let's kind of break into this. We'll start with the lore here because it's pretty lengthy here. So Chaos Dwarf Sorcerers rule over the desolate empire Zar Nagran with iron-fisted malice, both as lords and masters of all they survey and as priests of the Dark God. Hashit. Their lore is terrible and ancient and involves the study of machines and the mastery of forge craft, weapon making, and the terrible chaos magics gifted to them by Hashit. Combined, these create terrifying weapons and arcane devices of power and destruction. It was the Chaos Dwarf Sorcerers, also known as Demon Smiths and Hellworkers, who led their people from the brink of destruction during the time of woe and first built the great and blasphemous city of Tsar Nagrund in ages past. And it is they that still command it today. Their works of sorcery and engineering are legendary, from the great obsidian and bustle towers and ziggurats drawn forth from the earth, and the dark iron towers raised up throughout the darklands, to the steam-hissing engines that crush rock in the slave mines and the baroque armor which adorns the chaos warriors of the north. All are their dark knowledge made manifest. Demon smiths are few in number, with perhaps no more than several hundred amongst the whole dwarf race capable of wielding their savagely powerful combination of science and sorcery. They possess no absolute hierarchy or single leader, although form and tradition dictates many layers and ranks of fealty and loyalty amid the great conclave of evil that is Hashut's demonsmith priesthood. Each is a power in their own right, controlling sections of the great city of Zarnagron itself or one of the outer citadels, and each has their own workshops, forges, strongholds, slaves, and soldiers who owe fealty directly to them. The strongest voice, however, belongs to the oldest and most powerful, as well as to those on whom Hashut's blessing are bestowed. Age and knowledge are respected by them just as much as by their dwarfs of the West. But tied up with this is a merciless intolerance of weakness, and favor and respect with them is only maintained through strength, wealth, and sorcerous might, which makes the politics of the priesthood deadly at all turns. The price the sorcerer priests and demon smiths pay for their position and power is dark one indeed. For should they show weakness, they will fall, and Hashut's demand for blood upon the altar fires is unquenchable. Worse is the great curse that lays heavy upon them, as the magic they work seeps into their bodies, evoking changes in them that are both unique and horrific. Even the most cautious and adept of them are not immune, although for the desperate or foolhardy, the curse comes on all the swifter, and as inexorably their bodies are petrified into immobile stone. In battle, the demon smiths of Hafshit are terrifying and unpredictable opponents. Their dark magics are able to draw upon the fires of the earth and transmute the air to ash and choking smoke as well as a fan of flames of hatred in the hearts of their followers. They are each also master artisans of war and may lend their skills to war machines crews or themselves bear savage and potent examples of their craft such as black powder weapons mighty armor flasks of burning alchemical oil demon bound blades and ensorcelled weapons each however must display great caution when they wield their occult power for each spell they wield could also be their last um we get dwarf rune smiths, right? And we get dwarf rune lords. And they have, by and large, kind of the same capability within the army. With the sorcerer, prophet, and the demon smith, it's kind of a split between the two. Um, <clears throat> let, let's read this here. Uh, demon smith. Chaos dwarfs with the demon smith rule are immune to psychology and also have both the infernal engineer and sorcerer's curse special rules. So the infernal engineer rule is, is kind of wild here. <laughs> it is pretty crazy. Um, and demon smiths, uh, sorcerer prophets are demon smiths as far as the game is concerned, uh, um, as far as the tabletop is concerned. So all demon smiths are not sorcerer prophets. All sorcerer prophets are demon smiths to help you guys out. But the infernal engineer basically gives them more or less the same capability as a dwarf engineer, but it's just wrapped up into one title. So a sorcerer prophet would be an engineer, would be a sorcerer, would have bombs, and has a special ability called Blood of Hashet and a Dark Forge weapon. Demon Smiths don't have all that, but they have a lot of it. So it's, they're, they're going to have to strike a balance here. 
where I think that the demon smith is who has infernal engineer. I think in Total War Warhammer, the Sorcerer Prophet would not have Infernal Engineer. And I think that that would be a way to just to kind of create a line of delineation between them and create role differences within the army. They might give it to them just to kind of say, okay, if you've got a Sorcerer Prophet, you don't need a Demon Smith because you get Infernal Engineer in there. Because I would look at this rule, Infernal Engineer, as a way of increasing ammunition, um, increasing range, increasing accuracy, just something to the war machines of the Chaos Dwarfs. Some sort of engineer-style role that we get with the with the, um, the Dwarf Engineer to kind of increase the combat capability of war machines. Now, Sorcerer's Curse is interesting because Sorcerer's Curse is basically... Um, a penalty <laughs> um, every time you cast a spell there's a chance that the sorcerer's curse kicks in and it's whenever you suffer a miscast you you take a wound but you also get plus one toughness so it's like oh cool so you get a you get wounded but you also get more stocky right you get you get more stalwart because you're turning to stone quite literally and i don't know how they would do this necessarily in total war warhammer because you can't have a straight up penalty because it becomes a like okay hey every time you miscast like if you if you um overcast something and it explodes into your face then you're going to get a, an even worse penalty for the chaos dwarves okay well then i'll just never miss i'll just never overcast with the dwarfs it's that clear and simple so i think that there has to be something where maybe they have a miscast base chance reduction but uh it gives them some sort of trade-off like increased melee defense because that's kind of how i look at toughness as a melee defense characteristic or maybe it increases something but sorcerer's curse has to have a balance for total war warhammer and i think that that miscast base chance increase is probably it in conjunction with a um, some sort of melee defense role now they also have naphthan bombs naphtha bombs naphthan naphtha 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 n-a-p-h-t-h-a bomb it's it's on the tamarcon book and it's like poorly obscured by the crap behind the page um but basically <clears throat> basically it's napalm they can throw napalm and that's pretty sick do the demon smiths get it or do the sorcerer prophets get it or do both so that's going to be the interesting thing of how they're going to strike the line between the two and what gets access to what. And we've seen stuff where legendary lord versions of uh, characters don't have all the abilities of their generic one just to kind of, again, make it unique or not feel overpowered in one direction or the other. So I could see the bomb being on the demon smith because there's also something called the blood of Hashut, which is basically a direct damage vial it's a little vial that they they throw and it does a ton of it does a really good amount of damage to a single target and i see the blood of hashit as being on the sorcerer prophet as essentially a um oh man the, the lore of death spell that is just completely escaping me right now um but basically just a high damage ability that just drains damage over time because this was basically used to hit something with a high armor save and work against their armor save so i think it has to be something a soul leech or whatever the hell it is yeah a soul leech i think it is uh something like a basically a bound soul leech for sorcerer prophets to let them do damage now they also have the dark forged weapons and these dark forged weapons have a bunch of characteristics that you roll at the beginning of the fight so i could see these as some sort of just straight up weapon ability that they've got like i don't think it's going to have a bunch of crazy things or maybe it would have an activatable where you trigger the dark forge weapon and it increases your weapon strength and your ap damage but it reduces something um all these things are bonuses for the most part so you've got plus one to the channeling attempts so it makes it better for your winds of magic uh once per game this weapon may unleash a strength three flaming attack so it's got a breath weapon uh that becomes subject to eternal hatred uh has multiple wounds special rule plus one to the demon smith's dispelling attempts or it's possessed <laughs> so you can see this thing has a pretty wild set of characteristics and we don't get anything with a lot of true randomness in total war warhammer like this um not necessarily so perhaps this is some sort of 
um, skill that you would then lock out, right? Like, okay, your Dark Forge weapon can be a weapon that increases your wins of magic and you lock out the other choices. Your Dark Forge weapon can have a slight breath attack, a bound breath attack, kind of like the, the carts for the Skaven that is like bound to right at the feet of your, of your character. Um, that could be a way that could be done for it. Um, maybe it gets grants immune to psychology and some other f- leadership benefits, or maybe it grants you for the multiple wounds thing. It gives you some bonus versus infantry, but each one of these is a skill that locks out the other ones. That's probably the easiest way to do it and the easiest way to make it translatable into total war warhammer. But that is your sorcerer prophet and your demon smith, which is going to be a pretty interesting character because it can pull from the lore of fire, metal, death, and hashet. Expect that for both your sorcerer and your demon smith. Next up, we have the Infernal Castellian as well as the Overseer. Now, whether that is a Chaos Dwarf Overseer or what have you, I don't know. Um, but these characters, I would expect, and we don't have a big lore blurb to read for them because of uh, that lore blurb being part of the, the Chaos Dwarf uh, Warrior. So the Overseer, I would expect to just kind of simply be very similar to Zelda the Black, just a generic character. You know, like, nothing crazy here, giving some bonuses to the Dwarf line. Nothing wild. And same thing with the Castellian. I don't expect him to really kind of be um, crazy in that regard. Uh, we know the Castellian has pretty much the same exact rules for an Infernal Guardsman. So maybe you have different Castellians with um, ensorcelled hand weapons or with fire glaives. You can have a choice between one or the other. Um, probably has Guardian as a passive of some sort to kind of give that that kind of staying power. Uh, but I don't think the Chaos Dwarfs are going to necessarily need that staying power like a lot of other characters or a lot of other armies do, right? When you have the delineation between caster and melee combat much like the dwarfs do right their their rune smiths and rune lords are still very stalwart folk so your dwarf overseer too um could be something different as well but it, it'll it'll be interesting to see how that all, both of these kind of p- play themselves together uh for the the actual game and another character we're going to have is the Hobgoblin Khan, which would be your non-special version of Gorda's, right? So you're just your character that's going to be uh, probably the one that's going to have Assassin, I would imagine, if it's, if it's, our, if it's our hero character. Um, and pulling from some capability around there. But I think it's going to be very, very similar to Gorda's with some sort of attributes that would hence uh, be uh, uh, attributed to um something along the lines of uh, uh, assassinating. But it'd be cool if he had a passive that helped out with raiding, as it's kind of the role that they, they kind of fill. So I'd be interested to see if they have something like that, even if it's more of the uh, Hobgoblin bonus attributes. But that's our other hero. And then our last hero is the Bull Center Taruk, which we already saw in the gameplay uh, kind of sneak. And it seems that it was only a great weapon variant. Maybe there are, maybe there are other versions of it, but it's just your your typical kind of cavalry hero character. There's nothing crazy about them. Uh, they get black shard armor, shield, additional hand weapon, great weapon. They've got those kind of options. But I I there's nothing that's really going to be crazy outside of that. Maybe that's going to have some sort of um. Well, I don't think this would be the one that would give training. I think that would be your um your Castellian would help out with training. Um, but I would like to see the Bull Centaur Tarak maybe help out with charge bonuses or something to help out with Cav to make it th- that that more of a Cav-centered hero character. I mean, you've got characters that are heroes that can be cavalry, right? Or can be on chariots. This guy just is a cavalry unit. So it'll be interesting to see what he kind of translates as because I don't think we have any other hero character. I'm trying to think off the top of my head as I say this. Any other hero character that is a pure... Like out the gate, it's a cavalry unit. It is, it is already on hooves, good to go, right? There, there's no centaur for the uh, beastman that is already a hero. So it'll be interesting to see what how this kind of translates to bonuses, what his passives are going to look like for the actual campaign map. So before we go into more detail across every unit, I want to talk about the special rules of the faction and what they might be like in uh, the on the combat map. So there's three big ones, Resolute, Relentless, and Contempt. And we see Resolute and Relentless, I believe, on the Dwarfs, if I can remember correctly. I, I, and I Trust me, I can't. But um, Resolute helps out with leadership and pursue 
same thing with relentless here. It's again, leadership related. So I would assume that this is going to equate to some form of leadership stuff. And a lot of those things don't always make themselves into total war warhammer tech. Again, for example, the dwarfs, they, they get like one of their three special rules. But the big one I want to talk about is contempt because we already know what's in the game. Chaos dwarfs, despite all their forms of life and see the, no, despise all of their forms of life and see them as nothing more than contemptible fodder to be exploited and disposed of as needed. They expect their lessers to show cowardice and weakness in battle and be restrained only through fear. As a result, Chaos Dwarf and Bull Centaur units are not subject to panic tests caused by friendly units which are destroyed or fail a break test within six inches of them. Unless the unit is destroyed or broken, is it itself a Chaos Dwarf or Bull Centaur unit? So the way I look at it, contempt is that any single Chaos Dwarf or Bull Centaur unit views everything else as expendable. And I think that's why we don't see expendable on stuff like Hobgoblins. Um, and I think that the things that we do see expendable on is to help Hobgoblins. I think Hobgoblins breaking, the laborers breaking, none of that matters to the Chaos Dwarfs, as long as it's not another Chaos Dwarf or Bull Centaur. I think that's how Contempt works. It's kind of like a limited scope expendable that applies to the entire army outside. Like, oh, Kadai Destroyer just uh, uh, blew up? Well, I don't care. That was a means to an end. I think that's how Contempt is probably going to be viewed as far as uh, the leadership goes for the uh, Chaos Dwarfs. But that seems to be the only rule that we actually see present on the current units uh, um the shield wall portion of the dwarfs is how you get like the charge defense in almost all the dwarf infantry so i think we're just going to be seeing contempt and relentless and resolute are just going to translate to flat leadership bonuses across the board so let's now transition and now we can get into the actual roster um for the sake of brevity i will not be going into all the lore of everything as we have already we're already much longer in this video than i had anticipated let's talk about the two laborer units and the two laborer units we have in the um fourth edition book are both orcs and goblins and we've seen what these stack cards look like right we th these guys i don't think need to have much explanation behind them i think it's just gonna right up be a expendable meat shield weak against armor poor leadership like we already know exactly what's going to come with them um and it just it fits pretty much exactly with what we get in the um army book the difference is though they could have a double-handed weapon or what we know to be a, a great weapon nowadays a halberd a spear an additional hand weapon or a bow so I do wonder if they will expand out the laborers into different unit styles and whatnot, or if there's anything coming down the line as far as DLC goes to give us different styles of laborers or different unit, uh, a higher unit variety. It seems that we won't get many. We're going to have Hobgoblin Archers. We're going to have Fireglaive Infernal uh, Guard, and we're going to have the Chaos Warrior Blunderbusses. So I wonder if we will have any more just kind of generic trash tier ranged infantry in the roster. But those are our two laborer units. Let's move over to some Hobgoblins. So the Hobgoblin units that we know are coming, or at least what we've seen from the unit cards, are the Cutthroats, that would have a sword and a shield, because that is what they had in their... Um, in the actual profile on uh, the tabletop, but they also had throwing knives. So I wonder if the cut uh, the cutthroats themselves will also have a precursor missile, just like we see with the hobgoblin sneaky gets. The other unit that we get now, the sneaky gets have bonus versus infantry poison attacks and a po poison missile. So I would imagine that the um, hobgoblins also get something of the sort the uh, the just just the the cutthroats um, maybe even having also poison weapons as well but i wouldn't i would definitely think that they don't have bonus versus infantry and they would have probably bronze shields now the rules for the hobgoblins they also have hobgoblin animosity which resulted in them fighting each other they, they wouldn't they wouldn't do anything in a turn if they didn't if uh, you rolled improperly and they also have a backstabbers ability if we look at the unit card for Hobgoblin Sneaky Gits, there is a little icon that's got like two crossed swords. I think that would either be Animosity or Backstabbers. I think what, they're, what they've done with Backstabbers is use it as their precursor missile. I'm not really sure. But <clears throat> maybe the Hobgoblins, if they, they want to kind of mirror the Backstabbers ability, they are better at chasing a unit that is broken and or shattered. Maybe they get a small speed 
bonus to take care of them or whatever it is. Um, and animosity, it's kind of hard to do because animosity was basically they would pay, they would, you'd fail animosity and they'd, they did, they would, um, uh, run or you'd pass animosity and they would be able to act as normal or you would kind of succeed. You get a, if you get a six, they kill one of the units and they get a plus one to hit. So maybe the animosity is if they're within range of a, boar, a chaos dwarf or bull centaur unit, then they get increased melee attack because that's what I kind of equate to a plus one to hit. But it's kind of an interesting rule that I don't necessarily see a one-to-one -one for Total War Warhammer because not acting in a turn is not a thing that you do in this game, right? Um, <clears throat> and penalizing you for using them is, is not going to be what they're going to do. So uh, that's going to be pretty interesting. But we also do get a Hobgoblin Archer unit uh, that you'll be able to take advantage of as well as a just kind of base unit. Now, the Sneaky Gits do have Fire Wheels to Moving and Stock. Uh, I'm sorry, Vanguard and Stock. So I wonder if the Hobgoblin Archers will at least maybe have Stock, kind of like we get with Goblin Archers, um, Night Goblin Archers that allow them to kind of move up the battlefield. So it'll be interesting to see what we get with them. But those are our Hobgoblins coming. Hobgoblins? Oh my God, Hobgoblins coming to the Chaos Dwarf roster. So this next section I'm going to break up between the Chaos Dwarf Warriors and the Infernal Guard because there's two different delineations between them. I've said delineations probably 19 times this goddamn video, but there's two marked differences. The Infernal Guard are a little bit higher up in the in the pecking order, and they were only covered in Tamarcon. Uh, the, the Chaos Dwarf Warrior and the Blunderbuss was a part of the 4th edition. So looking at this, the Dwarf Warrior has exactly what we're going to be expecting right the axe and the shield counterpart the great weapon counterpart and now the blunderbuss so three across the board pretty one-to-one -one here nothing crazy um on top of it too they get contempt as we've seen with their unit card and their unit card is actually it's pretty goddamn good when it looks at just simply the great weapon variant has 30 melee attack and 34 melee defense that's more on in line with a long beard than it is with a dwarf warrior and that's pretty great with 85 armor 75 79 leadership i think it's probably 75 probably flat um they do get fire resistance because of their dark shard armor and all that which is okay or black shard armor whatever <clears throat> which is okay i, I don't think a I, Fire is something I would want to use against an army, like the lore of fire, an, against an army that has light units, right? <clears throat> I'm going to use my Flaming Skull. It's going to rip through tons of Skaven. I don't ever think of really using fire, except for the Flaming Sword of Ruin, against a dwarf army in any way, shape, or form, because it's not going to do that much damage. It doesn't have a ton of AP in it. So we'll see how that really translates. I feel like the, the fire resistance is not going to be insanely useful unless there's portions of their campaign where they're dealing with a lot of fire-based stuff so curious to see how that's all going to play itself out but those are our dwarf warrior units that are covered across the three variants as we've seen in the unit cards and in the campaign let's play um, also worth noting they have a hundred unit size um, i believe that probably on ultra um, and their uh the great weapons obviously are going to be uh, ap damage of course and the blunderbuss too uh, not not to gloss over that because uh, I completely just did. Um, <clears throat> there's still 28 melee attack and 32 defense. So I think that their profile is probably the, like the dwarf warrior profile that does not have a great weapon is probably going to be um, 30 melee attack with much more substantial melee defense because of the shield, right? Probably in like the 50 or 40 section. Um, and a weapon strength that kind of floats somewhere in 34 because we're, we're looking at the Dwarf Blunderbusses. And the Dwarf Blunderbuss 2 has a range of 90 with 49 missile damage and AP and pinning fire, the same kind of fire that we got uh, from the Skaven weapon team that's got the little Gatling gun. So it'll be able to slow things down that are charging in, which could be pretty exciting. Um, it'll be It'll be... Fun to see how that works. Uh, but let's now move into the other Dwarf Warrior portion of this. And the Infernal Guard, which are our better Chaos Dwarf Warriors, are also split up between the Infernal Guard and the Infernal Iron Sworn. So your Infernal Guard have some weapon choices here, right? We get the Great Weapon version, we get the Axe and Shield version, which might be solely related to the... Um, 
Which, no, no, no. I'm looking at the, the unit cards right now, and I see the Great Weapon, and I see the Axe and Shield, then I see the Iron Sworn, which are the ones that have flaming uh, axes and flaming helmets. Then we also get the Fire Glaive, right? So, we have a lot of different... The Hail Shot Blunderbuss is also an option in the rule book. Um, so, that's that might be another option then for them. Um, <clears throat> That's probably what they get with the Regiment of Renown, right? We have that one Regiment of Renown that's shooting a gun, and it's probably a, that Hail Shot Blunderbuss. Um, the Infernal Guard and the Tamarcon filled the core role that the Dwarf Warrior would have filled otherwise. The Infernal Iron Sworn fills the special role, which is just like a little bit better of a, of a, of a unit. And they have just one more weapon skill. That's kind of the difference between the two. Um, with pretty much the exact same stuff that they have in source old weapons, so weapons that are a little bit better. And that's what I expect us to see when we take a look at the uh, the units in the game, right? The, it'll probably just be a little bit more of a stalwart version of the Infernal Iron Swarm uh, with magic attacks, flaming attacks of the sort. Now, the Infernal Guard, with their access to hand weapons, their access to a great weapon variant, and their access to a... Um, Fire Glaive, the Fire Glaive is a pretty interesting little ditty here because it's a very short ranged weapon. It has 18, ra 18 inch range, um, so it's not like a super. Hey, my brown rice is done. Um, but a strength of four with armor piercing. And then the Fire Glaive in close combat <clears throat> would probably perform very similar to a, um, uh, a halberd so giving it ap damage and, and bonus versus large which which will be pretty wild so you've got your great weapon to just straight up do ap damage and you've got your fire glaive which does that ap and bonus versus large with some shooting capability giving you a little bit of range punching power with these infernal guard um but they also can have uh the naphtha bombs which will probably be either put onto the overseer um or onto the actual guard unit themselves uh, which would be nice too. They do have stubborn. So expect these guys to kind of really hold the line here with their black shard armor too, giving them some pretty substantial bonuses towards fire. Again, not so sure how beneficial that will be, um, but it'll be pretty interesting to see what that overall kind of equates to. Because uh, those, those the fire the iron sworn, the better ones, the one with the ensorcelled weapons, will probably have a bonus versus um, infantry, if not just a very high... Um, a very high weapon strength because of that ensorcelled weapon. I would I would imagine it to give it some sort of additional attack power. Um, but I guess to just being flaming attack and magic is also pretty substantial. So those are our two infernal guard options. Now there are those dudes with the masks, and those I think are the immortals, which I think would probably also be a um, a bonus versus infantry AP. Infernal Guard Iron Sworn, or Infernal Iron Sworn Regiment of Renown, because I believe the other one, the other uh, Infernal Guard that we saw is just that Infernal Guard with the Hailshot Blunderbuss Regiment of Renown too. those two that we saw on those uh, unit cards. But those are our Infernal Guard Iron Sworn and Immortals. So much unit, so many units crammed into one spot. Moving over to the cavalry section, we have got the Hobgoblin Wolf Raiders. Now, we know that they come in two different flavors, right? The Wolf Raider with a bow and the Wolf Raider with just an, a sword and a shield. And that's to be expected, I think, of them. I think they're just going to be your typical fast cab. I think they're going to play very similar to Goblin Wolf Riders, with these being Hobgoblin Wolf Raiders. Um, they do have that Hobgoblin animosity, so it'll be interesting to see how that will also play itself out. Um, because we, we, you definitely see something on the hobgoblins as far as a little icon. So I, I would love to see if we can, if they, if they have more under the hood than just simply being goblin wolf riders, but that say hobgoblin, you know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> they have cowardly despoilers too, as a special rule. Um, and that, Here's what it says. Hobgoblin Wolf Raiders gain a plus one to their combat result on the first turn of combat if they successfully charge an enemy in the rear or flank. But if they are themselves charged, they suffer a minus one to hit on their first turn of combat. So this could be simply, to, to remove the penalty, it could simply be a bonus to charging rear and flank, kind of like we get with Slanesh units, which I think would be very cool. Uh, we, we don't get that with the Goblin Wolf Riders, and it would be a cool way to draw a, 
delineation, there it is, to draw a line between the two and show off a difference, right? Uh, a little bit of a, a, a different dichotomy between them, like having the, the Hobgoblin Wolf Raiders be that unit that is meant to kind of charge rather than kind of screen out charges. Make them be a little bit more of aggressive in their profile and their portrayal rather than, again, being a defensive unit or a harassment unit. And I think it's kind of be the same way, too, with the uh, the Hobgoblin Wolf Raiders with bows. It's just your, your bow version. Now, I would expect them both to have Vanguard, of course. Um, I don't think they would have stock. Uh, I think it would be just a, a, a typical kind of a fast cab unit that has all those kind of bells and whif- whistles attached to it. Interestingly enough, they are considered rare in the army book, which was you were limited on the choice of rare, uh, on the amount of rare items you could bring, or rare units you could bring in your army. So um, I don't think that that would entail anything in total war warhammer i don't think that that you're going to look at hobgoblin wolf raiders as being very high up in a tech tree of buildings at all i think they're they're probably pretty easy to um to recruit or at least hopefully probably going to be a hobgoblin building and then like a chaos dwarf building and then the infernal guard and iron sworn will probably be on their own building as well more than likely the other big cav unit is the obvious one in the bull centaur so we get a lot of variations of the bull centaur. And I think the bull centaur is going to be a very cool unit to take advantage of because it seems to have so much flavor that's being added here because we get the axe and shield variant, we get the great weapon variant, and then the dual hand weapon variant. So we know right from that characteristic right there, um, bull centaur renders, which are the, um, the ones with just axe and shield have 114 weapon strength that's ap damage 50 armor on them with 38 melee attack and 48 melee defense 40 charge bonus 87 leadership 62 speed that's pretty sweet that's pretty damn sweet um they do have scaly skin which is how they're equating that 50 armor um, but they've got contempt which we've already talked about they would cause fear we see that reflected in the uh, characteristic. They get Siege Attacker, which is pretty cool, actually. Um, <clears throat> but the other two variants are going to actually give them AP and Anti-Infantry with the uh, two hand weapons, or AP and Anti-Large. Or probably actually just straight up AP, honestly, with great weapons. I don't know if it would actually give them Anti-Large. Usually, it's Halberds that would give the, the bonus versus Large. It'll be interesting to see how they, which one they choose there. But that's your straight up uh, uh, really heavy shock cav for the uh, dwarfs. And honestly, it's it's a pretty solid profile. I mean, the 48 melee defense is a little bit more of a perpetual combat variant, right? With the centaur renders, you can just send them in, have them fight. And they can go fisticuffs, it seems like. With, with it being a monstrous cav unit, right? With 16 units, it's going to be a little bit easier for it to push in and out of combat. So I think also doing cycle charging with them on whatever unit you'd like to is going to be more palatable than a unit of like, you know, 50, 60, whatever it is for a typical uh, uh, cav unit charging in. So this will be a really nice hammer to the anvil that is the Chaos Dwarfs. And I think that it's one of the reasons too that the Chaos Dwarfs are really going to shine above the Dwarfs because they'll have all that frontline staying power and, and durability with a really heavy hammer, right? Like these guys are not light. They're, they're really going to be doing some pretty good damage here. And it's going to be exciting to see how they uh, play out on the actual battlefield. It is time now to talk about our Kadai. And we have two different types, right? We have our Fireborn and the big boy, the Destroyer. The last blog post with Drazoeth gave us a little bit of a taste of what the Kadai are going to be like. And the Kadai Fireborn have a range capability, right? They can throw their body at things. Uh, so they have some sort of range capability, but they also have Unbreakable. But they're also demons. So... Their equipment is Spite and Hellfire, that's their hand weapons. Uh, their special rules are Unstable, Unbreakable, Fear, Flaming Attacks, Blazing Body, Bound Fire Demon, and Burning Bright. And we're seeing Burning Bright as any time they, uh, if they become broken, they lose their, un- their uh, Unbreakable, or is it Shattered? Whatever it said, where they lose Unbreakable and become subject to Demonic Instability. So that'll be pretty interesting too because they also have Bound Fire Demon and their... Um, uh, blazing bodies so we know they're going to be getting a reactive damage characteristic to anyone who attacks them as stated in that blog as well flaming attacks causing fear so uh they're obviously going to be susceptible to magic attacks as being uh, unstable and being uh, bound fire demons and whatnot so <clears throat> 
they'll also have like that leadership profile that, that fits in line with demons as well. So I think these guys are going to be very fun and very interesting to see on in the combat or on the combat in on the combat on the combat map and how they're really going to kind of bring a lot of damage to the board for the chaos dwarfs. But it seems more of a mid range style of unit that will throw some damage out, do some AP, then jump in and rip stuff up. Um, I think that their their hand weapons will probably be pretty destructive. They they don't have a pretty insane attack profile. They've got five strength. That does allow for a good amount of damage being done. Um, but <clears throat> by and large, I think they're going to be that kind of mid-range fire thing. Very similar to Sepulchral Stalkers from the uh, Tomb Kings list. Now, the other big boy is the Kadai Destroyer. That blog did tell us a little bit about it. It's a large target, right? And it gives us a bonus versus large, which is going to be cool. But if I look at the, uh, the army book, I also get it has Terror, Large Target, Frenzy Special Rule, and also that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that was the rule for it. So I expect it to be kind of a pretty disgusting unit, especially if it does get the frenzy that it had from uh, the army book. I mean, it has five weapon skills, seven strength, six toughness. So I expect this thing to have a pretty good amount of melee defense for it being a large target. But the way that the uh, uh, single target huge constructs in or huge things in general in Warhammer is their, their melee attack their defense tends to be a little bit lower, but I expect it to have a lot of armor because it is wreathed in armor. It is covered in armor. You've seen how huge that goddamn thing is and it's basically a fucking transformer. But those are our two Kadai. Uh, I wonder too if they will have bonus versus infantry, the Fireborn, since they're having two hand weapons. So that, that wouldn't surprise me either. So having the, the big destroyer being the large, the anti-large, another one being the uh, anti-infantry. But our Kadai are going to be a very fun, monstrous unit to have in the roster for the Chaos Dwarfs. One thing I did want to attack on about the Kadai destroyer that I forgot about is all the rules from the Winds of Magic supplement that give it even more options, right? Like Brazen Wings allows it to fly. Uh, Dark Colossus allows it to just pretty much smash apart fortifications. Gore Blades gives it reactive damage. Razor Horns gives it incre increased impact hits. So I do wonder too if they, I, I definitely don't think we'll see a flying version of the Kadai Destroyer. I, that's, I just don't think that they'll do that. I think it might be just too much. Um, but maybe there's maybe some sort of Hellforge upgrades for these or something that you can do to the Kadai Destroyer to give it a little bit more, uh, even though it seems like it's going to be just disgusting as is. Um, but I did want to quickly bring that up because the supplement does have a bunch of different options for them and it is worth kind of mentioning. Our next big boys are the two Tauruses, the two Tauri, the Bale Taurus and the Great Taurus. Now we already saw the Great Taurus in action um, in the campaign playthrough and it had some pretty great stats, right? It had a, a 80 speed, 60 leadership, 50 armor, 46 melee attack, 28 melee defense, 450 weapon strength and 80 charge. That bad boy is ripping and gripping. And it does have terror and fly and all that fun stuff, but it also has an innate bonus versus fire. It has a flaming uh, breath attack in the rule book, but it has this, bla this blazing body where basically it would um, give it flaming attacks, which we see that to be true. Um, and fueled by fire means that no lore of fire spell is supposed to work against the Great Taurus. Um, I think that this is going to give him probably a really, really, really high um, fire resistance. Um, but he does have some ability where when he hits the ground, he causes like a slam around him. And I think that's how we would probably see his flaming breath attack rather than actually giving him flaming breath. Um, his unit card doesn't show a flaming breath attack. We saw him kind of jumping down. He says he causes terror, flaming attacks, and an AP melee. So I don't think we'll actually see from the Great Taurus at least any kind of flaming attack, um, a flaming breath attack. The Bale Taurus might have that instead. The Bale Taurus, for all intents and purposes, is a better Great Taurus. Um, he has flaming attacks, fly, large target, terror, breath weapons, um, blazing body, and fueled by rage. But he has frenzy and hatred. Both of them have them on their actual profiles in the tabletop, but maybe the Bale Taurus will actually have Frenzy. And they've got a special stale, uh, a tail attack and even have a higher amount of armor. So I think that the Bale Taurus 
will maybe have some sort of breath attack. And maybe that's how you draw that line. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say delineation. Uh, that's how you kind of get a difference between the two, the dichotomy between the two. And also, I think that having Frenzy makes it more of a scary combatant. I don't know if we're going to see the Bell Taurus as a mount. We definitely saw see the Great Taurus as a mount. And we get Cinder Breath as a Bell Taurus as a mount. So I don't know if any generic characters will use the Bell Taurus aside from... Um, uh, uh, Drazoth almost said Astrogoth. <laughs> Imagine Astrogoth on a, on a Taurus, man. That'd be that'd be wild shit. But both of them are going to be pretty cool because we get them as separate units, not simply as mounts solely. Um, you know, you you don't have that for every single faction, so it'll be cool to kind of get a feral quote unquote version and the mounted version for that character. But those are our two uh, ter uh, tar Taurus, no Tauruses, Tari. But we have one other big boy to talk about, and that is the Lamasu. So Lamasu is. Still in the vein of the Great Taurus. Um, it's just a rare mutation, and it's more of a sorceress one. So we get fly, large target, magic resistance, and terror. And I think that would be the big difference between the two, right? Is that uh, you're getting fire resistance on the other one. This guy is more of a magic creature. And even the, even the lore that they've created from the blog post says that to be the case too. And we saw from the trailer that they get some form of breath attack and it's called sorceress exhalation in the rule book grand salamasu a strength for breath weapon which is magical very easy very simple and i think that's how we would get them is a is a is a magic attack unit but maybe they also give a bonus to wins a magic reserve or whatever it is they get sorceress miasma magic weapons carried by models in base contact with lamasu lose all their magical properties and are treated as normal weapons but from what the boy the blog described it it seems that they're going to be getting sort of a mortis engine effect where in, when they're in combat, they'll actually do more damage. And it says that it shrouds people around it or underneath it. So perhaps something like uh, the, what's it called? The, uh, the Kotal, the, the, the flying thing from the Lizardmen, probably have a similar characteristic here with the Lamasu, um, your, your Protoss barge. Um, also, in the rule book, the Lamasu is a mage, was well, a wizard, uh, and it has spells from fire, death, or shadow. So maybe it'll have a bound ability, one, two, or three, of each one of those uh, lores, which could be pretty cool to see, uh, depending on which those lores are. And we see t we see plenty of, of large centerpiece units having bound magic attached to them, usually two spells. So having that Lamasu had that ability would probably make sense. If it has a breath attack and a mortis engine effect and some sort of shrouding ability, maybe only one spell probably to fit, fit, to fit some kind of balance. Um, but I think by and large, it, it simply would be uh, a bound spell represented from one of those three lores that they take advantage of. But now it is time to talk war machines. And and the Chaos Dwarfs have plenty. The first one I just want to get out of the way is the Hell Cannon. We've seen the Hell Cannon on the Chaos Warrior roster. It's going to be here in the Chaos Dwarf roster. We've already seen it from the campaign Let's Play. It's part of the uh, second building in the line that grants us access to the Hell Cannon. So we know that's coming. So just, just to kind of get that out of the way. It's there. But now we get a bunch of different versions of the uh, the dreaded engines of war. And the Iron Demon <clears throat> is one of the first ones. So you have the Skull Taker as another, Skull Cracker as the other one. And the two of them are very similar. Now in the tabletop, they could actually link up together. And I don't think we'd get that in this. I think we'll get individual war engines that can do their own thing. And the Iron Demon was something that could just kind of plow into things and do damage, but it had a steam cannonade on the front. So a short ranged, um, smaller cannon. And it looks like there's two in the actual picture. Uh, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that actually plays on the, on the battlefield. If it is two, that we get just two shots of, of cannonballs coming out of this thing. Um, but I think this thing is kind of a little bit more intended or it, it not, it is intended <laughs> to be used ramming through things. And I think that's going to be sick. It's going to be a war machine that just kind of bulldozes through stuff with the ability to do a short range fire, a uh, short range cannon shot onto them. Much in the same way that the Skullcracker will be. 
And I think probably the Skullcracker and the uh, Iron Demon will have two different types between either bonus versus large, bonus versus infantry, AP, non-AP. Uh, the Skullcracker was meant to kind of take down fortifications. Designed for crushing fortifications and walls, the Skullcracker is a hissing and grinding arcane mechanical conglomeration of iron hammers, hacking blades, and brutal picks designed to literally pulverize and shred anything unfortunate to be caught in front of the machine. When conducting its impact hits or thunder stomp attack, an iron demon equipped with a Skullcracker may roll 2d6 instead of the usual d6 when rolling for its number of hits. In addition, in the case of scenario rules where buildings can be destroyed, hits caused by Skullcracker gain a plus one bonus to wound against buildings and fortifications. So the Skullcracker, I wouldn't be surprised if it was just really kind of meant to rip down um, walls. And I think even the Iron Demon could do the same thing um, because you're replacing the steam cannonade, the, the, the gunshot, the, the cannon shot, with a Skullcracker. The Skullcracker, I, I think, will just play very similar, just probably have a different attack profile with its intentions, probably a different, a higher charge bonus too because you're losing the ability to shoot short-range cannonballs and gain the ability to do more damage. So I think that's how you're going to look at the two. Iron Demon's going to be meant more for that mid-range to actual bulldozing into things, while the skull Skullcracker is probably going to be more like a like a tried-and-true super... Um, chariot unit that just kind of rips through stuff and takes names now the other two are more on the range counterpart we have both the dread quake mortar and the magma cannon the magma cannon is just a straight up shot here man flaming shots multiple wounds it is just going to shoot right down the pipe at you uh, it's exactly what you would expect from the word magma cannon now the dread quake mortar plays very similar to Queen Bess in the way that I read this because it shoots a very long range shot, high damage, multiple wounds, armor piercing, quake, slow reload. And I think the big focus here is the mortar is going to be just like not an anti-infantry on its actual profile like I expect the, the magma cannon to be. I expect it to be an AP anti-large uh, thing. But the uh, mortar shot I expect to do more damage, more have a higher explosive damage, just like we see with other mortar units in the game. But it has this quake special rule that basically makes it that anytime you hit a unit with it, the unit slows down as if moving through dangerous terrain. So I think just like Queen Bess, right? Queen Bess shoots and leaves that kind of burning, cindering little uh, uh, pool of destruction. Same thing here with the Dread Quake Mortar, slowing things down too and probably doing additional damage to them. And it says slow reload, so maybe it does have a very slow reload, so a high damage capability, uh, slowing things down, doing damage just like a Queen Bess, but not an actual uh, single unit, probably just a very destructive one. The other unit is the Death Shrieker Rocket Launcher. So if you've played Warhammer 40,000, you've played Space Marines, you know the difference between a crack and a frag grenade, right? Frag is meant for killing large amounts of units, whereas the crack is meant for killing a large unit. And that's what we get with the Death Shrieker. The Death Shrieker has two different type types of rockets, the Death Shrieker rocket or the Demolition rocket. One has a lower strength and in infernal cindy areas that, that kind of blow apart and do special attacks and cause panic attacks. Or <laughs> panic, panic attack. Yeah, it was an extreme anxiety attack I got from having that thing shoot at me. Um, but... The other one is a single target. So I think it's exactly how we would see with different firing modes from, say, a bolt thrower, right? But this time it's on a damn rocket launcher. So you're either going to do more of a multiple smaller um, incendiary type of attack that does a bonus versus infantry, uh, more meant at clearing chaff units, or you have a single rocket you are launching at something to do a bonus versus large heavy AP shot. And I think that's sick. That's such a cool way to kind of, um, I'm not going to say the word you think I'm going to say, but it's a really cool way to show a difference between the Chaos Dwarf rockets, the uh, Cathayan rockets, and the Empire rockets, where we get that really cool difference here of attack profile for them. Same range, just different style of attack and profile. But those are our uh, war machines. So the last thing I want to jump into is a real quick kind of uh, speculation on Regiments of Renown. Moving down the list here, our first one I want to talk about is O is Ogla Khan's Wolf Boys, which would be the Hobgoblin Wolf Raider Regiment of Renown. And these guys have bows. So 
what I'm saying here is that this would be a Hobgoblin Wolf Raider Regiment Renown and not a Hobgoblin Wolf Raider Archer Regiment Renown, which I would assume has an Archer profile versus the Wolf Raider having a attack profile. So attack profile with some archers is what I'm trying to say. This is a hybrid unit now. And I think that it would have fire wheels to moving. It would have bows um, and vanguard deployment. And that's very similar to what we get because this is an old regiment of renown from the regiment of renown book that came out ages and ages ago. Kind of, uh, I'm sorry, from the dogs of war book that came out ages ago. So I see these guys just simply kind of being that that one to one with that unit just being uh, having some uh, bows to take advantage of. Now we do have a Chaos Dwarf Warrior Regiment of Renown, and it, there's no real contextual tips I can get from the uh, um, from the icon, and it doesn't really make much sense to me what it would be. Uh, the other thing is the Chaos Dwarf Infernal Guard with probably the Hailshot Blunderbusses, which I've said quite a few times now. Um, maybe even having access to those bombs too that we talked about, and that's how that regiment now ex exists. Uh, the Infernal Iron Sword Regiment of Renown. Um, I think that is going to be the Immortals. Those guys with two axes, as I talked about, the two axes and the Death Mask dudes. Those are going to be the Infernal Iron Sworn that we see. The bull centaurs, uh, the bull centaur ren renders with dual weapons. I don't know how that'll be. They they have a different coloration, so maybe they'll be kind of like Zinchian. Maybe they'll have a barrier on them or something of the sort, because uh, they don't look crazy in the in the icon. But that color might might just say like, oh, it's a little bit of Zinch sprinkled in there. <laughs> I shouldn't Zinch had a baby, and maybe they've got some other uh, cool balance capabilities, perhaps an higher a higher armor capability, uh, magic weapons, whatever it is. Now, we also do get an Iron Demon Regiment of Renown, and I don't know anything of what that could possibly be. Uh, perhaps it would be a different Karen capability, a uh, different type of attack coming out, maybe the, uh, having magic attacks as well. Uh, maybe a, a special style of damage profile coming from the Karenade too. Maybe a shield breaker thing or sundering armor, something of the sort that it gives it a little bit more punch as Regiment's Renown go. But... I did want to just kind of quickly gloss over the possible regiments from now and what they could be in the Chaos Dwarf roster. And at that, it brings our very large video here to a close. So let me know in the comment section below, how are you feeling about what we've talked about here? We've, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, I did leave out a lot of the lore of a lot of the units because I felt like what I really wanted to talk about in this is more the unit roster and how it might translate into Total War Warhammer. And we're going to find out soon anyway, right? By the time this video comes out, it's what, like two weeks until the DLC lands? And then, boom, bango bongo, we see everything. And we'll probably have some sort of reveal of what that roster looks like in some way, shape, or form prior to its actual launch. So we'll see and have a get a, a sense for that and other things. But let me know in the in the comment section below. You know, we there are not all the unit cards that have been revealed, so let me know if you think, "Hey, you know what? We didn't see the Chaos Giant. Where is that? Uh, the Siege Giant?" <clears throat> Do you think that that's coming in this DLC? Would you like to see it? Do you think that then puts too many monstrous creatures into the roster and it's just kind of completely blown out of control? Or do you think it's one thing that we really do need? But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Very excited for the Chaos Dwarf DLC coming out. Make sure you use that affiliate link in the description and the pinned comment and do follow me on Twitch. But have a good one and take care.